Hey there, this is Patrice Washington from patricewashington.com where we chase purpose, not money. Welcome back to another episode of Redefining Wealth. If you are an OG listener or a purpose chaser, then the next two weeks are going to be a refresher for you. Uh, because I decided after that 100th episode that we celebrated just a few weeks ago that I really think it's important to bring all of the new listeners from all over the world up to speed about what we truly mean when we talk about redefining wealth. And if you're new here, here's the foundation of what you should know. Wealth in our eyes is truly not about just money and material possessions. What it boils down to for us in this community is that wealth is about well-being. And so we seek to find well-being and find fulfillment in many areas of our lives, understanding that if we don't get clarity around those things, we will always have challenges with money. And that's the reason that so many people make financial goals. And no matter how often you say, I'm going to save more this year, I'm going to pay off debt this year, I'm going to start the business, I'm going to do whatever those things are that you're saying. The reason that it rarely materializes the way that you believe it should, even though you have the education and knowledge and information, is because you're probably lacking wisdom. And wisdom tells us how to apply those things, but it's really hard to use wisdom when our minds are so cluttered by so many other things and our lives are so unfulfilled. And what most people do is try to fill those voids and find fulfillment in buying stuff or making more money or thinking that any combination of those things are going to be the answer. And oftentimes we find more than not that it's not the answer at all. It actually creates more and more problems when left unchecked. And so instead of saying, as I've been saying for over a year, go all the way back in your podcast app to 2017, when I first broke down the six pillars, I thought now that we are a hundred episodes in, that it would be great to say, go back to right around episode 102 and 103 so that you can really get clarity around what it is we're talking about when you hear me reference the six pillars of wealth. And so if you're brand new, great, because you get to understand truly what the foundation of redefining wealth is. For some of you, this is a refresher. Some of you met me speaking or heard me on interviews or podcasts, and you may have heard one thing or another, but this will be a great way for you to get it all. So make sure you stay tuned for these two weeks. And let me tell you how I decided to break it up, not necessarily in order of pillars, but when I think about redefining wealth, I think of us as almost a school or an institute, an academy, right? Like this is the stuff many of us wish we learned a long time ago because we would have made so much more progress by now. And so when I think of, let's say, a university or an institute, I think of two different tracks or schools of thought. One we always hear about, which is the wealth building in some form or fashion. The other, to me, is well-being. So this week, we are going to break down what I think are the pillars that would relate to well-being. And then next week, we'll do wealth building. So Stay tuned so that you can hear the first three foundational pillars, not in the order that they're usually laid out, but what relates to well-being. And for me, that is the fit pillar, the space pillar, and the faith pillar. Now, before I jump into this rewind, I have to let you know that it's being brought to you by Holistic Healing with Amy. So Amy Sumstein was a critical care nurse for nearly 20 years And she didn't go back into the industry because she promised herself that she would rather keep people out of the hospital than be a part of the temporary fixes that are usually provided inside the hospital. So now using Tower Gardens, Amy is helping the masses learn how to heal themselves with the right foods. She's at holistichealingwithamy.com. And basically, Amy believes that in order to avoid a lot of the stuff that's out there, the pesticides or any of the hygiene issues that usually come up with the pickers and just different things that you should probably grow your own food because you can go from tower to table in minutes and ensure your food is safe 
and that you're saving money with this tower. Uh, it's easy to assemble. There's no weeding, no digging, no messy soil. It's perfect for small spaces or for those of you who may not have a yard. It's eco-friendly. It uses 10% of the water used for traditional gardening. It's sustainable and it uses 90% less land and water than any traditional gardening. So there's no waste. You pick only what you eat and then you stop trashing the rotten produce. And so on these tower gardens, you can grow your own arugula, Brussels sprouts, kale, strawberries, tomatoes, cilantro, oregano, whatever. So if you are ready to heal holistically, that's from the inside out, and you want to talk to Amy about what foods you should grow and how you should do it, head to HolisticHealingWithAmy.com and schedule your free call now. That's HolisticHealingWithAmy.com. Now, let's jump in to this rewind. I want you to hear the breakdown of why I believe that you need to incorporate the fit pillar, the space pillar, and the faith pillar in your pursuits to do better with money. I know that as soon as you heard me say fit, someone got an attitude. (laughs) You think that fit is all about going to the gym and that it is a piece of that, but it's such a small piece because here's the bigger picture, really. I truly believe that your health is your wealth, right? And I am not out here as much as I do everything that I do because I feel called to do it. I'm also very much running a business, just like you probably are, because I tend to attract a lot of entrepreneurs. And if you're not, you're going to work to get money. Right. You're going to that corporate job or wherever you go, the nonprofit sector, government sector, wherever you are going to get money. But are you going to get money so that you can spend it on prescriptions that you can't pronounce? Like, are you going to get money so that you can spend it on diseases that are threatening your life that are going to cause your demise, in which case the money won't matter anyway? Like, no. And so I truly believe that each one of us is called to do something special, man, like to do something great in the world. And that means that there is purpose and vision on your life. And so if there's a vision on your life, I truly believe, I truly believe that it is your responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's our responsibility to protect the vessels that are needed to execute that vision. Your body is the vessel. And I realized a long time ago, because if you haven't seen me before, I'm a pretty slender build, right? And that would automatically make people think that it was all good. But let me tell you, being a slender build does not make you healthy. Being thin or slim or trim or whatever you want to call it doesn't make you healthy because I look slender and had high blood pressure. I look slender and had some other stuff I can't even pronounce anymore. Thank goodness I don't struggle with it. But in 2014, I was sick. And I was also on a national book tour. So here I am. I prayed for this book tour and I'm going all over selling thousands of books. Yay, yay, yay. But I'm dying before and after getting on stage, like literally ready to kill over. Like I'm not at my best. And so at that time, I start to say, you know what, God, how do I have the audacity to be praying to travel the world? And I can't get around Atlanta without huffing and puffing. Like I'm having tubes put down my nose, which go down my throat, down to my stomach to monitor my gut. And I'm walking around with this little contraption taped to my face, literally for two days so they could monitor all this stuff. Like, come on. And as an African-American woman, what really alarms me is how many of us in particular are dying from diseases that are preventable. I mean, the United States in general, our food system is crap, to be real. But so there's no matter what background you come from, there's an issue. But particularly in African-American households, oh my gosh, seriously? And then a lot of us are not going to the doctor, the proper doctor. You have one general doctor, but you got all these other issues and you should be seeing a specialist, but you don't know. And come on, you guys, seriously, your ability to produce wealth is really connected to how you are treating your body. 
I stand up at book signings for two, three hours straight. If you've ever been to my book signing, you can attest to this. I'm not lying. I talk to every single person. I stand there in high heels and I lock eyes and I take pictures because if you ever come and see me, I will not dishonor you by sitting down. I have to be sick to sit down. And I'm not knocking authors that play that route, but I am literally so honored and grateful that people would take their time to come and see me in person, that your picture is going to be the bomb. If we have to take 10, it is what it is. You are going to tell me whatever story you came all the way here to tell me. You're going to share whatever aha moment. I want to hear it all because it's encouraging to me. It's that thing that keeps me going as well, you know, but you have to be physically fit to do that. So I'm like, how can I be asking God to put me in front of more people, but I have to sit at a 30 person book signing? No, negative, negative, right? So I want you to think about your own life. Are you physically capable? Are you being intentional with what you put in your body, with how you treat your body? Are you being intentional so that you can actually see this thing to the end so that when you hit those goals, And when you see this vision come to fruition, are you going to be able to walk in it, live in it, breathe in it, taste it, smell it, enjoy it? Or are you going to be in a hospital somewhere? That's a real question. And then beyond the physical fitness, here's another thing that's really important in this fit category. It's your mental fitness. Because again, I feel like a lot of us are praying for things that we don't have the mental capacity to sustain. You want more, you want to do more, you want to have more, you want to be more. But then there are things that are really challenging you. I know for me, I was dealing with a lot of childhood trauma. And I would say I wanted one thing, but then that something from that childhood would kick up, whether it was feelings of unworthiness feelings that I wasn't lovable. I had abandonment issues. You know, I got daddy issues. (laughs) Like I have all these freaking issues. My mom worked so much and bless her heart because she's a single mom and I'm from Belize and my mom was very big on taking care of my grandma and, you know, her family members back in Belize. And so my mom was just busy all the time. And as much as I knew that she was working and doing all this stuff, you know, as we as a parent now, I say I'm doing this for you. I still felt abandoned. I still felt unloved. It just is what it is. It's not a right or wrong. It just is. And I needed to go to therapy to deal with my childhood trauma. And I'm convinced that I had I not gone to therapy, I would not be America's money maven. Like I could not be a best-selling author. I cannot just sit here in my home studio and even share this with you. I had to get through that stuff. I had to learn techniques and tools and strategies to cope and to heal and to forgive people who will never say I'm sorry, right? And maybe you've heard me share this in social media, maybe not, but I could not look at myself in the mirror until I was 25 years old without cringing, literally. People always say that, like people who knew me from middle school, high school, college, they're like, I would have no idea that you had such low self-esteem. I really did. I mean, we all wear a mask, right? I was great at covering it up. I knew I was smart. I knew I knew how to make money. I knew I had personality. So I just felt like, you know, all those things could work together and maybe take attention off of what I look like. But secretly, because I'm a chocolate girl from Los Angeles, California is where I was raised. And, um, you know, it was not cool to grow up chocolate in the land of the light skin. I'm going to just keep it real. It was, you know, I remember being eight, nine, 10 years old, scrubbing my skin, trying to see if I was just dirty and if it could come off. I literally just wanted to scrape my skin off and hope that something lighter was underneath. Like I have very full lips. I have, uh, you know, kind of a broad nose, not super broad, but I had someone in my family call me thick lip. And that was the first time I realized I had full lips. Before that, I, you know, you don't know. You just, you're just you, right? And you tell a kid that at like seven, eight years old. So now I'm like tucking my lips in and I'm tall. I'm 5'10". And so when I put heels on, I'm a smooth 6'1". And people would be like, oh, you're too tall. You're taller than the boy. So then I start slouching. And then I was super thin, but I had this athletic build. So I had big, big thighs. 
And, you know, someone in my family called me Thunder Thighs. And that, I mean, I could not catch a break, you guys, seriously. Could not catch a break to save my life. And I had no one there being intentional about saying, like my husband and I do now to my daughter, you're beautiful. You're good, but you're going to be great. Like, you have no idea. Oh, my gosh. My daughter, I'm like, look at your athletic build. God built you as a goddess. I am so intentional. My daughter has no issues. She's mini money maven. She's 10 years old. No issues with self-esteem, but I was a wreck. And then you add not really having boobs for a long time. I'm telling you, not cool at all. And I remember my husband, when I was 22, I went on a trip with one of my best girlfriends and went to Spain and Italy. I was gone 21 days and I had just gotten this apartment in Westchester, which is near LAX. And I came back and he was so excited. I got the apartment and I left. I didn't really have time to decorate or put anything up. I just got it and I left. When I got back, this man, which is why I kept him around, had gotten furniture and totally redid the furniture. Couldn't get anything expensive, right? But like he reupholstered the furniture, painted things. It was beautiful. Put my clothes up. I'm talking like real man ladies, okay? And then I was so in awe of all of that. But then I saw these huge pictures of me blown up and framed all around the place, all around the living room. And I ran out. I ran out of the apartment crying. I'm talking boo-hoo bawling. And he came after me like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? What don't you like? And I knew that he loved me already at that point. Like I knew that we were in a good place and he wasn't a mean spirited person or a cruel person. But because I felt so little about my appearance, like I was just so low in the self-esteem department when it came to my looks and I had never looked at myself. I hated every picture. I didn't look at myself. I wasn't big on that at all. So when I saw the pictures blown up, It was like he was playing a cruel joke. And I know that seems totally irrational, but let me tell you, by that point, 22 years of being kind of, or I I really started when I was about six. So let's say 16 years of being told that you're ugly. The last thing that you want to see is a blown up picture of yourself and multiple ones. And it was my husband that started to help me see myself in a different way. One time he looked in the mirror with me. I don't even know if he remembers this, but He looked in the mirror with me in this apartment and he's like, are you kidding? Like, do you see what I see? Like your eyes, your almond shaped eyes and your lips are beautiful and your cheekbones. And I really had to borrow his faith for a period. And I would affirm just different things about myself um, in the mirror. And it took some years, but that's why I tell you guys, I was 25. It took years. I was 25 before I could look in the mirror and not cringe. And then I went to therapy and in therapy, we started to draw out where this started, how it started, what that really meant about the person or people who were saying certain things to me. And I started to heal from that thing. And thank God that I did because I could not be who I am today had I not healed. I could not be here 11 years later. I'm 36 now. I couldn't be here today with my face on three books, getting ready to be put on a fourth book. Like I could not be on national television monthly, right? With millions of eyeballs. I could not participate in social media that is so, you know, driven by selfies and stuff, which I would have never done back in the day. Like I could not be all of who I am today, but I also couldn't serve you because if I was not in a better place with what I look like, I would be too afraid to get on stages, And speak to people about how to heal their finances. Like I would be too afraid, you know, to go to these conferences and networking events. I couldn't have done it. I did well and I did well, excuse me, in real estate back in the day, but it really wasn't all this. It was a brick and mortar shop. Most things were done over the phone and fax. Yes, fax machines and email. I didn't have to have this much, you know, frontward facing time with people, but I'm so glad that I did. And so I know that sitting on that couch, right, like is so connected to the financial success that I have today. And so a part of redefining wealth is we're going to pull this stuff out. We're going to talk about it. 
We're going to make, as one of my girlfriends says, therapy a lifestyle because I don't want you to be held back. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. It doesn't matter how talented you are. You cannot show up and be your full self when you are living through your nine-year-old lens, right? Like when you can only see people and circumstances and places, and this happens like through the lens of who you were in 1989, that is really going to be a problem and your wealth is connected to it. So a part of redefining wealth and having well-being in this area of fitness will not just be me sharing things about you know physical fitness and all that stuff because I love detoxing. I love beauty regimens. <laughs> I love working out. I love trying new ways to work out that don't bore me. Or ex- I mean, I want to be exhausted, but not exhausted. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I love talking about that stuff, but I also love the opportunity to help you really get clear on what some of this mental noise is that might be holding you back. I want to jump into the third pillar, which is space. And space is about setting up a life that supports you. Because I really believe that a part of wealth is about being able to control and maximize your time. And time, as you know, I'm sure is your most valuable asset, right? We've all heard time is money. But the thing is, so many of us don't set our lives up, our environment, our space up to support us. So we end up wasting a lot of time and therefore messing with our money. And many of the wealthy folks that I know, that I've spoken to, that I've interviewed myself have so many systems in place to help them operate at their maximum capacity. And it's so important. I mean, there are stats out there. Maybe you've heard this already, but Newsweek put out a stat that says the average American wastes 55 minutes a day. That's like 12 days a year. We're talking two weeks. That could be your vacation time. Looking for things that they own but can't find. Looking for things that they own that can't but can't find. And then Forbes says the typical executive wastes 150 hours a year. That's almost an entire month. Searching for lost information. Now, I know I'm not the only one who really failed at um, (laughs) setting up their Dropbox with the right system from the get-go. I can't be the only one who knows you have something digitally, but it takes you a while to search for it. You don't remember how you saved it. There was no system in place. I literally had to start from scratch in Evernote. That's a whole other story. We'll get to that in one episode. I'll teach you my new system. But oh my gosh, you know, that means that you're losing thousands of dollars a year. We're losing so much time. We're losing money. We're losing energy. And those are all things that you need to redirect towards you building wealth. And one of the things that I've learned from working with people over the years is that the average person doesn't just misplace things, right? It's not about just setting something down in the wrong place and forgetting it. That's some of it. But another reason we can't find things is because it's usually hidden by some form of clutter. Oh, some might say, ouch. It's usually hidden by some form of clutter. And here's what I believe. I believe that clutter is the physical manifestation of confusion in the mind. Let me say that again. Clutter is the physical manifestation of confusion in the mind. Every time I feel stuck in an area of my life, When I really take a step back and examine the physical areas around, I realize, okay, this energy is getting stuck because this area is messy. For example, when I used to work with people one-on-one doing personal finance coaching, most people who would not have a clue about their finances also didn't know where any of their financial documents were. There was a direct correlation. Like if I asked a question about their bills or their credit score or any of that stuff, and I started to tell folks and I took them through this system. I'd say, look, we can't get your financial life in order if your financial documents are scattered all over the place. Like if you have some of your bills in a magazine you were reading at the hair salon and you've got some in a junk drawer in the kitchen and then you leave some mail just in the mailbox. Some of you guys don't even check the mail, (laughs) right? Or it's in a car, it's on your desk at work. You have things everywhere. There's no system. Of course, your financial life feels out of control. 
Of course it does. But then let's go to something, even like what I deal with on a weekly basis in my home office. Sometimes I sit down wanting to record something or wanting to write, you know, for my books or for a blog post or something. And I start feeling stuck and I, it's, you know, just really irritating. It's like, I know what I want to say, but the words aren't quite coming out right. And then I take a look around and guess what I usually find? A little pile somewhere that I haven't dealt with. I travel a lot. So there might be all the mail that everyone thinks that I'm the only person in the family that likes to open mail or something. So there's a pile of mail, junk mail included. There's stuff around. There's things that I use to travel with that hasn't, they haven't been put back up yet. And so as soon as I start to clear that, the flow comes back. Because when you look at this little, these little piles of clutter, for me, they're little piles. For you, it could be an entire garage. It could be a storage unit. It could be your closets. It could be all that stuff that you have piled up on your kitchen counter. But the truth is that energy and creativity gets stuck. There's things that get stuck. There's no flow. And money is currency. So every time you feel yourself being stuck, you got to go, where's the clutter, right? Like, where is the energy that I normally would have to put into this task or that I want to have to put into getting my finances in order? I really have to look around. And I can't tell you, I was on a speaking tour, Steve Harvey's Act Like a Success Experience speaking tour this summer. And I was sharing this on the stage. We did four cities, Dallas, LA, Chicago, and DC. Every city I left, I ended up having someone say, I went home and cleaned up my office or I cleaned out my closet, or I cleaned out my car. And every one of those people had a success story about how they had this divine download of information or an opportunity came to them, or they found money. (laughs) They found checks in the envelopes that they had been avoiding because they thought they were only bills in the mail. Like there is so much that comes out of this. Your wealth is connected to you getting rid of the clutter so that you have the freedom to create, so you have the freedom to think, so you have the freedom to manifest whatever it is that you need in your life, in your business, whatever. And when the environment is out of whack, that energy just gets stuck. There's no flow, right? And so there's different ways that we can talk about setting up your life to support you. And we're going to do that. In this podcast, that's one of the pillars and those are some of the topics we'll cover. Organization for different areas of your life, whether that be digitally or physically. You know, we'll talk about beautification. I really believe that there's a link to you really enjoying and loving the space that you're in. You know, when I lost everything and I went from the 6,000 square foot home to a 600 square foot box, I call it, in Metairie, Louisiana, My daughter was a baby, and I remember finding a Target gift card from her baby shower. And we didn't really have much money. We were getting eviction notices, water cutoff notices, electricity cutoff notices. I mean, when I tell you this was a bad time in my life, it was a bad time. And I could have used this $50 Target gift card for anything. But can I tell you the truth? And you might judge me. I don't care. The truth is, I took that $50 gift card, I went to the Target right near where we lived. If you're from New Orleans area on Veterans Memorial, over in that area, went to that Target and I got a shower curtain and some nice little rugs and this little container to hold our toiletries and a few towels and washcloths. And when my husband got home, I made up, it was red, black, and white, never forget I made up this little teeny tiny bathroom so nicely, right? Because I wanted us to have a space in this itty bitty apartment that we could go into and just (sighs) exhale. Like we could go in there and just feel like, okay, this is a nice space. Doesn't matter that this isn't the best neighborhood and we hate what's going on outside this door. But in here, there's there's some room to breathe. I kept that teeny tiny apartment so clean and so nice. And I remember when people from our church would come over, 
you know, we had the nerve to be trying to entertain in there. Listen, <laughs> the Washingtons love to entertain, but they would come over and I would have candles lit and have it smelling good and clean and just feeling good because I don't care what's going on outside the door. I understood even in that time that a part of me getting back to where I had come from had to be about me honoring the space that I was in. So there was no room for clutter. There was no room for disorganization. There was no room to allow things to just be ugly and out of place, right? Because the other thing is, I really believe in gratitude, staying in a space of gratitude. And from what I've observed is when you take care of your space, you tend to value that space more, right? You value that space more. You, you show more gratitude for that space. And gratitude is a wealthy habit because when you're walking in gratitude, and, and just trying to be the best you can be despite the circumstances, you get to attract more of the same because I believe that when we whine and complain, we repel success, we repel wealth, we repel money. But when we speak words of gratitude, what we verbalize, we magnify and we magnetize in our own life, we get more of that. And so even in that little space, I was committed to using my $50 gift card to make that space as beautiful as I possibly could. And I believe that that was a planting of the seed to get back to where I am today. The other thing is, I believe that when you value your space that way, you start to really observe who you allow in that space, right? Like you start to allow who gets to be in your life, who gets to be around you. When our space is in disarray, we don't, we don't take care of it. So we don't really care about who comes in and out. It's kind of like, oh, you want to come over? Cool. Oh, sure. You want to stop by? Cool. But when you have created a space that is organized, that is clutter-free, that is beautiful, where the energy is right, it's smelling good, it's feeling good, you got your music on, you don't want any old body to come and interrupt that space. Let me tell you, you come to my house uninvited, you're going to stand in the doorway, pretty sure, unless we have a great freaking relationship. I don't allow anyone just to walk through the threshold, you know, because this is my sacred space. This is where I get to create this podcast and my videos are shot in my home uh, that you see on YouTube every Tuesday. And so much of the work that I create, so much of the work that my husband does is done in our space. So many of the people who support us in our businesses, you know, we do that in this space. This is sacred ground. And I treat it as such. So if you treat your space as sacred ground, if you treat that environment that way, then that means you also start to protect any and everyone, protect yourself from any and everyone who wants to just intrude in that space, right? And so space is such a big part, such a big part of your wealth. Because when you are at your best, when you can get to the things that you need to get to carefree, Right When you don't have to run around like a chicken with your head cut off, looking for this and looking for that and getting frustrated and being upset, your mind is not cluttered. Your mind has the freedom to create magic, to make some really phenomenal things happen, to think about who are the people that you need to partner with or what are the opportunities that you need to go after. That space is important. And some of the stuff that we're going to talk about is how you protect that space, how you set up that space to support you, how to make sure that your environment flows and that the energy is right and that you can be your absolute best self because we know that time is money and you don't have any more time or money to waste. So that is a part of the pillars for redefining wealth. I'm so looking forward to the conversation today because the fourth pillar is faith. And man, oh man, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I would not be here. I would not be America's money maven. I would not be this best-selling author. I wouldn't be a media personality. I wouldn't be sitting here in my home studio completely restored from where I was in 2009 sleeping on my brother's couch if it were not for my faith. And the whole lesson behind the faith pillar 
is really about believing in something greater. It's about believing in something greater. Now, you may have heard little snippets of my story. And as you subscribe and really take in this podcast week after week, you are going to hear a lot, probably a lot more than you bargained for (laughs) from a personal finance expert. But I do love the opportunity to be able to not keep talking in sound bites and be able to truly share like my real story. And you may have heard some of this, but here's what you need to know. I don't care what these videos that come out every Tuesday on YouTube look like. I don't care what I look like on stage to you, what I look like on television or what you think. What I know for sure is that I just don't look like what I've been through because I have been through my fair share of trials in life. And of course, a few of them have been much more significant and traumatic than others, but I've been through a lot of stuff and I know that if it were not for my faith, I wouldn't be here right now. I couldn't be here right now. Sometimes I look at the things that I've been through in my life and I'm like, how are you not in a corner balled up sucking your thumb and weeping all day long? Now, have I had those moments? Oh yeah, absolutely. But the ability to get up and keep going has really been about this belief in something greater It has been me always coming back to this feeling that, you know what, this is not even about you. There is something bigger at work here. And a lot of times what I've realized as I get on the other side of some of life's trials is that, you know what, that didn't even happen to me. That happened for me because most of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned, if not all of the greatest lessons that I've learned, have come from some type of challenge some type of trial or tribulation, some type of failure. And I love Winston Churchill's quote, which is, success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And the only place that I've learned to grasp that enthusiasm is in my faith in really believing that there is something greater on my life. Like when I'm going through a challenge, I'm the first to say, honey, I must be getting a blessing in these next few days. There is a blessing somewhere with my name on it, right? Because it's all about how we choose to frame things. And um, a couple years ago, I, I was getting this award called the Claire Huxtable Award um, from an organization out in Atlanta. And they did this icebreaker that I was watching um, the day before during the conference. And they wanted you to go around and meet people and start with, you wouldn't know by looking at me, but, and your job was to fill in the blank and essentially be vulnerable in a sense with like complete strangers. And it really got me to thinking about all the things that people say to me and the messages. And I get the, you know, people would say, you know, you don't know what it's like to fill in the blank. And I'm like, I don't know what it's like. What gives you the impression that I don't know what it's like? Because, you know, you never can judge a book by its cover, right? Which is why that people pillar that I talked about last time was so important because you just never know who people are, who they're connected to directly and indirectly, like what their true passion is or, you know, just you just don't know. And. I accepted that award by sharing some stuff that people just didn't know from seeing me in social media. You don't know from my four minutes of sound bites on television or a three to four minute radio segment every week. Like there's a lot that you don't know and you don't see. And the award was for being a mother, wife and professional woman who was balancing it all with style and grace. And I started to share And one of the things that I shared was you wouldn't know by looking at me that 11 years ago, now it's 11 years, whatever it was at the time, but you wouldn't know by looking at me that before my daughter was born, I gave birth to a one pound, six ounce baby boy who lived for less than five hours. And he literally took his last breath in my arms, holding my right index finger in his tiny hands. So when women in particular talk about their struggles with miscarriages or any type of infertility issues or just difficult pregnancies, fibroids, whatever, I, I identify with that. And that's why I look at my daughter every day as a miracle. But I know what it's like. I even know what it's like at this point. 
I want to do a whole episode dedicated to secondary infertility. Like that's a whole nother issue that people don't really talk about, but it's a challenge that I'm even experiencing. And I'm not even, I, I, I wasn't anticipating saying that in this episode right now, but it's something that I think that we should talk about because people can sometimes be insensitive, right? But I also haven't let those experiences hold me back from doing so many of the things that I know I was called to do or being a testimony to people outside of being America's money maven, being a testimony to other women, to other mothers, to daughters, to sisters, to whatever, right? You know, I also shared during that speech, I said, you wouldn't know by looking at me or by looking at pictures of my husband and my family and I in our matching clothes on Instagram that people love to tag with hashtag relationship goals, that this marriage to my husband, which has been almost 10 years now, has truly been the ultimate test of my faith. And if you are married, you already know what I'm saying, right? Like when you get married, you are looking at all the upsides of the vows, right? You're looking at the for better, not so much the worse. You're looking at the in health, not so much the sickness. You're looking at the richer, not so much the poor. And in 10 years, my husband and I have gone through all of that, right? We've gone through losing it all, being broke, living apart to save money and scrape up change, to get back on our feet. We've been through medical difficulties. We've been through some things that have literally threatened the very destiny of our family, our family's legacy. And yet still we're here. Still we stand and actually now stand stronger than we've ever been. And that I'm convinced that the people that you marry are so connected uh, to your financial success. I think that's obvious for more than one reason. But that's a conversation that you have to have when it comes to your wealth, right? And through it all, I know that the only reason I've been able to push through and persevere is because of my faith. Because believing that there's something greater has allowed me to maintain this mindset that there's just always a bigger purpose at work, right? And like I said, nothing is ever happening to me. Oftentimes it's happening for me. And it's taught me that life is only 20% what happens to us, but 80% how we choose to respond to what happens. This faith pillar has done so much for me, even down to just showing me that nothing in life has meaning except for the meaning that we assign to it. Because I really do believe, you've probably heard me say this before, that what we verbalize, we magnetize and we magnify in our life. We bring more of it to us or we make situations as great as we want them to be based on how we speak about them. So I know that if I make a choice to whine and complain, then I'm also making a choice to attract more of the same. But because of my faith, when I make a choice to fight for my gratitude, right, that attitude and that perspective that I nurture will grow and it wants to bring me more of the same. So faith is about just maintaining a sense of hope and peace when really you should have none. And in a world that wants to distract you with all kinds of things that are going to disrupt your peace. My faith has really taught me about being still. It's taught me about getting in alignment with my higher power. Because I also realize we live in the world, you know, we're, we're baby Googlers, right? We, we can Google anything that we think of. And so often that's even a distraction. Like sometimes there's information overload. And we've asked so many people's opinions and we've Googled so many different articles and videos and there's a million ways to skin a cat. And then we suffer from analysis paralysis where we end up doing nothing. And therefore, we're no closer to the wealth that we desire. But that faith component really encourages you to be still and quiet and allow for that that still small voice that already has all the answers that you need to guide you, like allows that to speak above all the noise and all the clutter and all of the different voices out there. I really think that my faith is the number one reason that I don't chase money. You know, this whole concept, if you look at patricewashington.com, it's all about chasing purpose, not money. But when you're not in alignment with anything greater, it's really hard to see a life that doesn't require chasing money. 
when there are no spiritual practices in place, nothing that you seem connected to on a deeper level, you feel like everything will be better once you have money. But the reality is so many people who have money don't have peace. They're not confident in the decisions that they make. They're not using wisdom and discernment and who they align themselves with and what relationships they take on and where they should go and what partnerships they should have in business. And a lot of it comes down to this urge to chase money. But your faith should really help you be grounded in the fact that you know most things are a resource, but you are getting divine revelation and guidance and inspiration from the source. And when you know what the source is and how that shows up in your life, chasing money just doesn't become an option anymore because you know who you are. You know who you're being. You know how you show up. And because of that, you can attract the lucrative opportunities. You can attract divine connections. You can attract so many things that will carry you effortlessly into your destiny and your prosperity. And so this faith pillar is huge. It is such a big piece of redefining wealth. It's such a big piece of you getting to the prosperity you desire. The answers are just not outside of you. So many of the answers are inside. And so what we're going to explore are what are some of the practices? What are some of the rituals? What are some of the ways of beings and habits that you can incorporate so that you can really tap into this? Because I guarantee you when you tap into that, whoo, there's so much financial success on the other side. Because what it does is create a sense of fulfillment. And we'll talk about that too. I have a great video on YouTube about fulfillment, how to find fulfillment. We'll talk about how you can actually quench that thirst that's inside, that's always looking for the new, new, always looking for the next, the bigger, the brighter, the shinier. But instead of that, instead of chasing shiny objects and trying to compete with folks that we have no business competing with, we can really tap into what speaks to us, what honors us, what honors our authentic self, just who we were created to be in this world and allow that to guide us to what it is that's going to create the wealth that we want. And so I can't wait to have those conversations. And I'm really excited because, oh, I have some great guests lined up. And these folks, in particular, the people that I'm talking about right now, they exemplify being able to incorporate their faith in some of the most unassuming industries. I have some folks from Hollywood in particular. And if you know anything about (laughs) the entertainment industry, it's a beast. Like you have to be a special soul to work in entertainment or it will rob your soul, like real talk. But when you are in true alignment with your faith and you come with those convictions and just know who you are, what you're gonna do, what you will not compromise in your life. Like there is such beauty in that. And so a few of the first interviews that you get to experience here on the Redefining Wealth podcast are gonna be from some people who have truly taken this pillar and just run with it. And I cannot wait to share these stories. Again, I'm gonna be sharing the stories of athletes, entertainers, executives, entrepreneurs, just some really high level folks who understand that this pillar right here in particular, all of the pillars are important. Trust me, they all have their place. They're like a perfect little puzzle on this journey to creating wealth. But this faith pillar is going to be a game changer, I think, for a lot of you. And when you hear these nuggets of just inspiration and how people have defied the odds in a lot of different arenas, My prayer is that it'll really be the game changer, right? It'll totally shift how you think about your faith and how you utilize your faith, not just to get you to the wealth, but understanding that it is definitely a key component. All right, I hope it was great for you to get the rewind and truly get down to the foundation of redefining wealth That was the first half, which is all about well-being. And while I was listening to those episodes, I thought I would go back 
and find other episodes that really underscore each one of these pillars. So I am including in the show notes today a list of my three favorite episodes from each pillar. Now, I love all of the episodes, but if you're new and you're trying to figure out, you know, or or you've identified, okay, this is the pillar where I know I need help, then I want to encourage you, go to patricewashington.com and you will be able to click on the categories and see all of the content I have around that pillar. So if you're struggling in the fit pillar, you know, I want you to go back to Dr. Tama's episode, Stop Suffering in Silence, or my ep- my solo episode, The Power of No Comparison, Egypt Sherrod's episode for space, or Marshawn Evans Daniels episode on the faith pillar. Like wherever you are struggling or feeling challenged and you need some additional support, go to patricewashington.com and you literally can choose a pillar and just get all you can there. Because if you're going to master this, if you're going to get better, then you have to go get the tools and resources that'll help you get there, right? Of course. So there's even some YouTube videos that are beyond just the podcast episodes that might be really beneficial. So that's at patricewashington.com. Check out the show notes. I have uh, three of my top episodes in each pillar. And I did that based on what really gets me excited and the stuff I usually still listen to and the top downloads for those particular pillars. So check it out. The list is extensive. It'll be a great thing for you to listen to while we're in rewind season anyway. And I want to remind you to rate and review and share the podcast. If you have some folks you've been telling about redefining wealth, this is a good time to get them involved Uh, We're on the road to our two-year anniversary in September, and my personal goal is to hit a million downloads. And so I would love your support with that. When you rate and review the podcast, it really, really does help people make a decision on whether they should give us a try. And when you share, right, like your referrals are the best referrals. So please share with other folks. Help me on the road to a million downloads. I appreciate you so much. And if you want to talk about any of this stuff, make sure you join us in the Purpose Chasers community. That's at I am a purpose chaser dot com. I am a purpose chaser dot com where you will meet like minded listeners from all over the globe and hopefully find some folks that you can really connect with and uh, create accountability with in your neck of the woods. And literally, they're all over the globe. So come join us and check it out. I am a purpose chaser dot com. Until next time, I want you to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment, and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later.